Jeff Anderson from the NCAR Data Simulation Research Section. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone that's worked hard to put this ISDA meeting together. These ongoing meetings are extremely valuable to the community, so thanks very much for your service on this. Today, I want to talk about a continuation of work I presented at the live ISDA meeting back in June in Fort Collins. I'll start off with the same slides I showed at that meeting that are a schematic of a sequential ensemble filter in the way that we think about it in the data simulation research testbed DART. So in this schematic, we have an ensemble of state vectors at some time T sub K. There's three shown here. We make a forecast with the model forward to time T sub K plus one, the next time at which we have one or more observations available. We assimilate the observations one at a time. So we begin by computing the forward operators H for each ensemble member. In this case, we get three estimates of an observed value Y. We then proceed to solve the scalar problem. We have a likelihood, which comes from the instruments shown in red here. And we then use Bayes to combine the likelihood in the prior ensemble. We get a posterior ensemble shown in the blue vertical bars and increments in observation space shown as the vectors. Then proceed to do a linear regression, a bivariate regression using the prior ensemble statistics of Y and a given state variable X. That's how we get the increments for X. And we do that independently for all of the state variables X in the model state. We then repeat that operation for all the other observations that are available at time T sub K plus one. And when all of those are assimilated, we then proceed to do it all again, moving the model forward to the next time at which observations are available. So in Fort Collins, I talked about a very general technique called a quantile conserving ensemble filter for computing the first part of this, the observation space increments, that's a scalar problem. As I said, that work is extremely general solution. It's now available in DART. It's also documented in this reference in monthly weather review from last year. Quickly looking at an example of what that observation space might look like. In this particular case, let's suppose I have a bounded variable, maybe the amount of water vapor or some other tracer. So it's non-negative. And so the prior ensemble is shown in the top in green asterisks. In this case, I want some distribution that bounds that. So I'll pick a gamma continuous distribution and I'll fit that gamma prior, the green here to the ensemble. I then get a likelihood. In this case, a gamma is convenient too from an instrument. The product of a gamma and a gamma is another gamma and that gives me the blue analysis distribution here. And then the quantile conserving filter gives a method to determine the values of the posterior consistent with that analysis continuous distribution. And that's the ensemble member shown here. And in this case, I'm guaranteed to not uh, violate the bound of zero. So I'll always have a positive amount of tracer. Now, unfortunately, as soon as one goes ahead and regresses those increments with a linear regression on all of the state variables, you can lose all those benefits. And so this talk is going to focus on ways to update unobserved variables so that you can continue to get those benefits. And that works in a transformed space. Here's an example of why linear regression is problematic. In this particular example here, I've generated a prior bivariate distribution. It's normal in the horizontal dimension. It is gamma in the vertical dimension. So you could think of it as a temperature in the horizontal that's observed. The likelihood for that observation is shown by red there. And the unobserved variable is maybe the concentration of ozone. So it is bounded and it is unobserved in this case. There's a 100 member ensemble sampling that distribution. And in all the figures I've showed that will look like this, the shading is going to indicate an accurate estimate of the real distribution with contours from 1% up to 80% of the relative probability density. So if I go ahead and solve this with a standard ensemble adjustment common filter in observation space and then do linear regression, I get a posterior that looks like the right panel. And the posterior members have all kinds of problems. There's a bunch of them that are negative for the unobserved variable. So that's a negative tracer concentration. And there's a bunch of them that are above the distribution. They're just not consistent. They're basically not following the curvature that you can see in the prior. This figure now shows the same posterior ensemble in green that was on the prior on the previous page. And I'm showing the least squares fit in the dashed line here through that distribution. That's used for the regression to compute the unobserved increments. And I've just shown in blue here 10 examples of increments that were computed in the observation space using a standard filter with the likelihood and then they're projected onto that least square slope line 
And you can see what the problem is. There's no reason for them to obey the bounds. A number of them here, six of them in this particular cartoon, end up being uh, negative tracer concentration. So a real problem. The solution I'm going to describe here today continues to do a linear regression, but it does it in a transformed space. And so I'm going to transform the marginals for both the observed and unobserved ensemble quantities here. This is a two-step transform, and the first step involves computing quantiles. It's very similar to what I did in observation space in Fort Collins. I pick an appropriate distribution for a continuous prior. I then compute the cumulative distribution function for each ensemble member to get the quantiles associated with the ensemble. And if I've picked a decent prior distribution, those quantiles are going to have a uniform zero to one distribution. And the transform for this particular case are shown in this figure. There's then a second step to the transform. I'm going to do a probit transform of those quantiles. The probit is the quantile function, the inverse of the CDF for the standard normal. Applying it transforms a uniform zero one distribution like the quantiles to an unbounded normal zero one distribution. And this figure shows what happens if you apply that in the example again. So now I can do linear regression here. Both of the marginals are normal. And so doing linear regression is the best unbiased linear estimator, the blue in, in this particular case. And you can see again, examples of the regression happening here. If I go ahead and do this for this particular example now, the right panel shows in dark blue, the standard regression. And in cyan, it shows a regression that's done in this transform space. And then the increments are transformed back. And you can see by construction that the cyan ensemble obeys the bounds, so there's none that are negative. And in addition, it also does better at representing the curvature in the posterior. In fact, you can show, I believe, that this exactly gets the posterior in this case, but I'm not going to discuss that further in this talk. Quickly, some mathematics to show what's going on here again. If I have a prior ensemble of an observed variable and an analysis ensemble of an observed variable, y sub super p and y super a, those are generated in the first step that I discussed in Fort Collins, and I want to get the update for an unobserved variable X, the prior of that. What I'm going to do here is I pick continuous prior distributions with CDFs capital F for the state variable X and the observation variable Y. They don't necessarily have to be the same. They're just appropriate for those variables. Phi is the CDF of the standard normal, so phi inverse is the probit function. And I'm going to use tildes now to represent the transformed functions in this probit space. So the X ensemble is phi inverse of F of the ensemble members. And similarly for the prior and analysis estimates, ensemble estimates of the observed variable. In the probit space, I can compute increments delta Y tilde sub N. And then I can use the standard regression that I would use in the regular space, the same as was done in Anderson 2003 to get increments in the probit space. I can then compute the analysis distribution in the probit space and finally invert the transforms to get the analysis distribution in the original space. Here's another example. I'll show a few more here. In this particular case, again, I have a normal observed variable on the horizontal axis, and I have a beta distribution, something that can be used for doubly bounded quantities like sea ice uh, fractional coverage for the unobserved vertical variable here. The prior is fairly uncertain, so it says, well, maybe there's a lot of things that are frozen, maybe there's a lot of things that aren't frozen. If you assimilate this observation, if you use standard regression, you get the blue asterisk. Again, they violate the bounds. If you use the quantile probit transformed regression, you get the cyan. It obeys the bounds by definition again, and it is quite consistent with the continuous analysis distribution. Another example that's even more interesting, this is, again, normal in the observed variable. It is a binormal in the unobserved variable, maybe something where you have a convection that's occurring or not happening, where you have sea ice that's formed or not formed. Again, if you look at the right panel, if you do a standard regression, you get a whole bunch of ensemble members in the middle where there's no possibility that the truth actually is. The science actually do extremely well from the quantile probit regression. They move ensemble members from the top mode to the bottom mode, and they realign them with the posterior estimate of the mode. A final example here, in this case, the observed variable is gamma, like the example I showed earlier. The unobserved variable is normal. This might be a case where you have a measurement of a tracer, and you want to see its impacts on a normally distributed meteorology variable. Again, there's definitely improvement. The standard regression in the dark blue leaves stuff trailing outside of the posterior distribution, and the cyan does not. 
you know, there's a pretty serious problem here still, and that is it may be very difficult to know the right distribution family. Is it really appropriate for a gamma here for a bounded quantity? Is a beta good for sea ice? But I'm now going to extend this method and use a non-parametric continuous prior, so I don't have to worry about that. In particular, I'm going to use a rank histogram prior. I'll show you what that is now. So if I have an ensemble with five members here, the rank histogram continuous prior probability is going to look like the following. I will put one-sixth of the probability uniformly distributed between each of the ensemble members. So one-sixth, one-sixth, one-sixth. And then I will put one-sixth of the probability on the tails in the shape of a part of the normal distribution. And that normal distribution will be the one you would get from a standard normal, but its amplitude will be selected, sorry, its mean will be selected so that there's one sixth of the probability. And so this is a continuous rank histogram distribution. Uh, here's another thing. By construction, its quantiles are uniform on zero one. You can also bound that. So in this case, if I'm bounded below at zero, it's a tracer concentration, for instance, then I can change from the normal, again shown here, to just a bounded thing on zero. And so I can obey the bounds again. So if I go back to these examples, here's the normal gamma example I showed in the first time. And now I'm not making any assumptions explicitly about the distribution. I'm just using this rank histogram prior. And again, I get, I obey the bounds by definition and I get a distribution that's very similar to what I got when I assumed the gamma. Similarly, if I go back to the normal binormal example, this time I'm just observing, I'm just assuming the rank histogram prior. And again, I get very, very similar results for the cyan. So this is a pretty powerful non-parametric method. Now, once again, as soon as I start doing other parts of ensemble data simulation, for instance, localization, I have problems in maintaining this stuff. So this figure shows two examples of localization. One increment localization as we do in DART in the standard space. One is increment localization on the right panel done in the probit space. The prior distribution for the binormal that I showed in the previous example is on the bottom in both cases. The posterior done in the new method is on the top in both cases. And then there's various values of localization along the vertical axis. You can see, for instance, for a value of localization of 0 0.5, almost all of the ensemble members in the standard localization end up in places where there's no possibility of the posterior beam. Whereas the probit knows that there's no possibility there, and so it actually jumps over the places of low possibility. It's a much more consistent uh, localization. Now, similarly, inflation can cause the same type of problems. In this case, if I have the gamma distribution from the first gamma normal example, and I try to inflate that prior with a multiplicative inflation, you can see the uninflated ensemble on the bottom as you increase the inflation to the top. And if I use standard inflation, I end up with negative members. So I've again lost my benefits. If instead I do the inflation in the transform space, either using a gamma prior here and, or using the rank histogram prior here, I end up not violating the bounds. So I don't get any non uh, negative members in the ensemble when I inflate. So quickly, the normal, normal case, suppose I'm just doing standard stuff. And it turns out, if you think about it quickly, since the phi inverse, the probit is just the inverse of the normal CDF. And if I assume a normal, then my um, quantile distribution is just going to be the normal. These things just cancel out. And so the standard normal normal distribution is just the same old linear regression in the standard space with an EAKF in the way we do it. Since the EAKF is exactly the common filter for a normal normal example, this algorithm is simply a complete generalization of the standard common filter. I want to quickly show some examples. This is a model of tracer advection. The wind field is the standard Lorenz 96 state, which is shown on the left, and it is used to advect a single tracer. There's a single constant source at grid point one in this case. Since the values of the Lorenz 96 state variables are more often positive than negative, you can see that mostly tracer is blown off to the right here in this time series. Occasionally, the wind reverses and some tracer gets blown back. In the examples I'm going to show, I'm going to look at concentration where the red vertical lines are. One place that uh, gets advection from the left, one that gets mostly from the right, and both of them have a tendency to go to zero concentration off and on. So in the assimilation example I'll do, I'm going to observe the state and concentration variables infrequently at each point. The concentration error is a truncated normal, so you don't get any silly negative observation values. This is a time series just using a standard EAKF of the tracer concentration at two grid points I showed before. The blue is the true state, so you can see plumes getting blown in. 
uh, from the left and the top one and from the right and the bottom one, you see times when the concentration goes completely to zero. And when you apply the EAKF, it is heavily biased. The ensemble mean shown in red, the ensemble members in green with an 80 member ensemble. And occasionally you get negative ensemble members too. So this isn't a very pleasing assimilation. If instead I go all the way and use a rank histogram filter in observation space and a rank histogram prior for the probe at transformed quantile, this is the results for the same observations. Uh, there's no longer any significant bias. The ensemble members are able to go all the way to zero. There's quite a bit of consistency here. I could show more metrics to show that this is actually working very well. A side comment, which I won't discuss more here, is we have a capability now in DART to do this with gamma, inverse gammas, log normals. And there are significant problems that are not fixed, making those distributions the assumption as compared to the rank histogram. Uh, finally, the implementation in DART is absolutely trivial. Basically, there's a single conversion of all the joint space state variables, so that's the state variables and the prior of the observed variables to the probe at space, and then literally the original DART code continues to be used. Our adaptive inflation algorithms, our localization, our sampling error correction all work as, uh, as is, and the parallelization is unchanged. So there is a DART alpha release that includes a number of examples of distributions here, normal, gamma, beta, log normal, bounded uniform, and the bounded normal rank histogram, in the near future, we'll also have particle filter, inverse gamma, and a number of fat tail distributions available. This release is not yet supported and it has not had its performance, so it may be slow, but it is available for people to check out. And you can actually see a link to that here. You can also find information about it on the main DART webpage. Uh, the QR code actually takes you to the release. Uh, in closing here, I'd like to thank Chris Riedel, Helen Kershaw, Marley Smith, Molly Waringa, and the rest of the DARES team who have been a great help with this. And I'm anxious to hear your questions at this point. Thanks. In that paper you have. Oh, great. Great. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Tobias, for playing that. So let's go to some questions. We have a couple of questions on the Yopad. Uh, question one for you, Jeff, from Javier. Is this just an application of Gaussian anamorphosis before the linear regression step, or is there more involved? So, the answer is exact definition of Gaussian anamorphosis in the literature is, is unclear. In most papers of Gaussian anamorphosis, the transformation is done so that it includes the observation step, and then you have to worry about transforming the likelihood. Uh, so we're not having to do that. This is all taking place just for the regression step. But given how you phrase things, it would not be unfair to say that it is simply doing a transformation to a Gaussian marginal space um, and then doing the regression. Okay. Okay. Um, Javier replies, uh, thanks. I was indeed thinking of the problem of transforming the likelihood. Yeah, and one of the, the key differences here is that I don't have to worry. So if the shape of the likelihood, the fact that if you transform it, it may very well not be normal if your prior was, it doesn't come into play here because that's all handled in the first step for better or worse. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so I have another question from Leduc. The question is, does this method depend on the order of observations in assimilation? So that's an excellent question. So even the original sort of EAKF linear regression algorithm in an untransformed normal space, uh, in the presence of localization, the order's gonna matter no matter what. And the order will matter in, the normal case there due to uh, truncation of numerical precision. As soon as you go to these other types of distributions and transform, I don't think there's any reason to expect that these things are uh, quantitatively independent of the order of the observations. I am not yet prepared to comment on whether I expect them to be qualitatively dependent on the order of assimilation, but I think the answer is probably yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, Leduc. Um, a third question from Jan Keller. Could the transform 
also be done using empirical distributions, i.e. CDFs. So the transform can be done using any CDF that you can specify. And so if you're talking about when you say CDF here, if that CDF is from a climatological distribution or some other place rather than just the ensemble members you have, then yes, you could do that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so, Jan Keller writes, thanks for the answer. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff.